Hello and welcome to EGM 702 Photogrammetry and Advanced Image Analysis. This is Week 2, Part 3, Spatial Statistics. Over the course of your um, GIS course or your remote sensing course, you are probably thinking quite a bit about spatial variables. Uh, and we can think about spatial variables in a number of ways and also as constituting a number of different components. So the first is uh, a deterministic component or a deterministic variable. And this is something where if we have some function uh, of x and y, and if we put in a certain x-coordinate and a certain y-coordinate, we're always going to get the same result back. Um, so there's no variation in this variable with space or with time. This is something that um, will always give us the same value back. We might also think about something called a sto stochastic variable or a probabilistic variable. Now this is a variable that does have some random variation and often we assume, uh, at least outside of uh, the geosciences, we assume that the observations that we're making uh, that go into these probabilistic models or probabilistic variables are independent. So this assumption doesn't necessarily hold in uh, geoscience or geostatistics because we know that the observations that we're making quite often have some spatial dependence. If you think about, for example, elevation, you know that if you go very, if you take an elevation measurement and you walk a meter away, it's going to be pretty close to the measurement that you, the first measurement that you took. If you walk maybe 100 meters away, it's going to be a little bit different, and so on. So we know that there's some sort of spatial dependence in that measure. And we can illustrate this with an example uh, here where I've drawn a very nice little hill slope. And we can think about this again as being composed of a number of different signals or different parts. So if we write this out as an equation, this says that the elevation at some location x is equal to some function m that takes in a value of x as well as a function epsilon prime and epsilon double prime. So the m of x, this is just the linear trend. This is the general trend that we would see with elevation as we increase or, if we like, go backwards with x. So as we go over this little bit, we go up a bit, and so on. Um, so there's this linear dependence that we see. We also see this spatially correlated variation. So we see that there's, you know, it doesn't follow this straight line exactly. There's some variation around that line. And this is the epsilon prime or the, uh, the spatially correlated variation that we're perhaps most interested in modeling with our probabilistic uh, approach. And then we also might have some noise, either because, you know, in addition to this random variation, we also have boulders on the surface of the hill slope, or maybe we have some instrument error uh, measurement noise uh, that results from that. So if we think about uncertainty, this is just determining the variance. So how much variance, how much a particular quantity varies uh, in either space or time. Um, so for example, we looked in the first lesson this week at the normalized median absolute deviation, or NMAD, or the standard deviation for our elevation differences. And this shows us uh, how much the value varies around some mean value that at least uh, for elevation difference, we normally expect to be zero. We expect that, you know, most of the time the elevation is not going to be changing. And how much that varies around that central uh, mean value tells us a little bit about how accurately we can expect to, to be able to measure elevation differences. So what happens if we want to think about looking at uncertainty for a volume change? So I've taken the uh, example from this week's practical uh, where we do some DEM differencing and eventually some volume calculation and what you can see is that that volume makes something that looks like a hill slope. And what we see with this as well 
is that there is very clear spatial correlation in the volume, uh, much like we saw originally with elevation. And we can also see this if we just look at the elevation differences. There's large areas where the values are very similar or fairly similar to each other. Um, and these are things that we need to keep in mind when we're trying to model the uncertainty or the variance for the volume change. Because if we don't include information about this spatial correlation, this fact that there is a spatial dependence uh, when we start aggregating variables like elevation change, we're going to end up underestimating the uncertainty in the volume change. So that's, that's what we'll talk a little bit more about in the rest of this lesson, is how we can think about that and how we can use this spatial dependence to more accurately uh, estimate things like volume, or more, more accurately estimate things like the uncertainty in volume. So often what we do when we're trying to model this variance um, as a function of space um, is we're using something that's called a semivariogram. So this is uh, most free, this is called either the semivariance or semivariogram, and this is represented by the Greek letter gamma, at least most frequently. And it looks something like this, where we have plotted along the um, Plotted along the y-axis here, we have the semivariance of some, some value h, and along the x-axis we have our h values, uh, which represent the distance between different measurements. And we can write this out as an equation where the semivariance as a function of h is equal to the average, 1 over n, of the sum over all i and j of measurements that are of the difference between measurements separated by that distance h squared. So this is a little bit like the root mean square difference that we saw before, other than we're not taking the, um, the square, the, sorry, we're not taking the square root of the value. And you also see that there's this one over two dependence because if we, if we don't have this one over two, what we're actually doing is we're double counting all of our z sub i and z sub j uh, because we can just swap them around and it's going to give us the same value. So we take 1 over 2 so that we're not doing that double counting. Now if our data have something called stationarity or if they are stationary then this tells us something about the spatial autocorrelation. So you can see here as an example the red line here represents the semivariance of data that have correlation at any distance, so they're always somehow correlated. If we look now at the, um, at the blue line here, we see that the variance goes up to a top value and then it kind of levels off, and this tells, you that, tells us that there is some distance at which we stop seeing spatial uh, autocorrelation or spatial correlation between our different measurements. So we'll talk right now just briefly mention or briefly discuss this word that I've mentioned, stationarity. So when we assume that our data are stationary, what that means is the, distrib the probability distribution of our data doesn't change when we shift it in space or time, which is to say that the mean and the variance are for the most part constant either in space or time. You can also think about this as saying that the same stimulus or whatever, whatever process, whatever mechanism is causing us, causing the response that we are measuring, it is going to act the same, it's going to provoke the same process everywhere in space or time. That that, that process isn't going to end up changing fundamentally. The, the probability distribution of the outcome of that stimulus is going to stay the same. This often requires that we remove any trends from our data uh, so that we're making sure that rather than measuring elevation that we know has a constant linear dependence, if we're looking at the thinking of the hill slope example that I showed earlier, um, we're looking at this spatially correlated random variation. That's what we're trying to model here. So the semivariogram, 
uh, has a number of different components that I'll mention here. The first is uh, lag, which on a previous slide uh, was represented by the variable h. And this is again just the distance between our different data pairs. The nugget is the semivariance value at zero separation. And usually this is not zero, this is something a little bit above zero, and this is normally related to our measurement error. It's the fact that you know we can't measure separate we can't measure very, very small separations. We usually have some difference. And so we end up having some variance even at zero distance between points. We also might see something called a sill, and this is just the maximum value that the variance that the semivariance attains, or it is the value at which the semivariance stops noticeably increasing as a function of distance. And Related to that is the concept of the range, and that is just the lag distance at which we see the autocorrelation either stop or diminish in importance. We can model semivariograms in a number of different ways. Normally the way that we uh, estimate the semivariogram is that rather than taking every single possible lag distance, we discretize it, we bin the values that fall within different categories of uh, separation distance, and then we take the average of all of those, all of those values that fall within that, within that um, category or that, that bin. Um, we can then use a number of different analytical models to model the semivariance or the semivariogram. Um, these are some examples shown here, things like the spherical, semivariance, or circular, uh, exponential, linear, Gaussian, and you can see what these look like. Um, so these are things that we're trying to fit to our data uh, so that we can actually sort of solve analytically either the uh, integral of this so that we can use this to estimate the uncertainty as a function of the separation distance, it can also, if we're modeling our semivariance, this allows us to use it in interpolation, which we see in the practical for this week. Um, so the, in the practical this week, we use a technique called Krieging, and it's actually going to be ordinary Krieging. Um, but this is where we're using the variance to interpolate or predict the values of our, whatever it is that we're measuring, at points where we don't actually have data. So what this, what this is, again, we're trying to model the local small-scale variation. If you think back to the elevation model, um, this is the, the black line that varies around some linear trend. Now, with ordinary Krieging, we have a number of different requirements. We need our data to be stationary. That means that you know, they're not, their probability, probability distribution does not change appreciably in space or in time which usually means that we have to detrend them somehow, and they need to be normally distributed. They need to follow a normal distribution uh, in order for us to be able to use ordinary Krieging. If these conditions aren't met, then we're gonna need to use a different, um, a different form of Krieging or a different interpolation method uh, in order to uh, predict the values at unsampled points. So once you get to this step in the practical, you should see that you're calculating the, or estimating the semivariogram as a function of distance. And hopefully you see that at some distance our uh, elevation difference measurements stop being correlated in space. You can see a number of different ways that you can model this, including combining different models. Um, I'll let you play around with that once you get into the practical. Um, so what this means then is that when we have our elevation data and we have some gaps in our elevation differences, um, we can actually use this variance that we're modeling to fill those holes and, and, and make a complete ele elevation difference surface that we can then use to, uh, to integrate, uh, to calculate volume changes. And we can use things like the autocorrelation distance or the, the range um, at which autocorrelation stops being important to actually uh, estimate the uncertainty in our volume change as well as the uncertainty in our, area, in our elevation differences.
to sum all of this up, uh, we're often working with variables that have some spatial dependence, which means that we have to account for this spatial correlation in our measurements, uh, especially when we start aggregating them, when we start adding them together to get areas or volumes, um, we need to account for the spatial correlation, otherwise we end up underestimating the uncertainty. The most common way that we do this is using the, something called the semivariogram or a semivariance. And we can use this both to improve our uncertainty estimation, but we can also use it to interpolate or predict values at points where we don't have measurements. And the nice thing about this as well is this also tells us how certain we are about those predicted values. Um, so we actually get some, some model or some estimate of the uncertainty in the predicted values, which we don't get if we use a different, sort of, a different form of interpolation. Uh, I put a few different resources on Blackboard. Uh, the first is a paper from 2009 by Rolstad et al. Um, that specifically is looking at using elevation differences um, and the spatial autocorrelation observed in elevation differences to accurately estimate glacier volume change or the uncertainty in glacier volume change. Um, the th I think it's the third section of this paper uh, has a very nice uh, discussion or a very nice um, way of stating the different uh, things that we've talked about in this lesson, so you can uh, have a read through that there. Um, there's also the Spatial Statistics Toolbox uh, from the ArcGIS software, and I've also included the Handbook of Spatial Analysis, which is a, a nice sort of textbook um, for, you, for doing this sort of spatial statistics or spatial analysis from the European Forum for Geography and Statistics. So that's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting. And if you have any other, if you have any questions, please be sure to post them on the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks, bye.